Hi, welcome to Talking Books and Stuff, the program that talks all about books and writing and stuff. Here's your host, Dennis Rimmer. Hello again. Welcome back. It's Talking Books and Writing and Stuff. As you know, a new episode comes out each and every Friday, so keep that in mind. And today, from Vancouver, B.C. area, talking to Katie Hislop with the Thai E. So, Katie, how's things going in Vancouver these days? Uh, not too bad, considering, you know, the state of the world. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's sunny today so that's nice we're, we're coming out of our usual doom and gloom rainy winter so that's yeah yeah that's it could good. be worse that's good so katie right now you're with the Thai E, which is yes. a online newspaper but before we get into that tell us a little bit about uh your early life like where did you grow up and what did you do as a kid did you read and write a lot or did that come later in life uh, you know the basic biographical details okay sure uh so i was born and mostly raised in, in st john's newfoundland um i spent my high school years though in a smaller town called clarenville um and i guess a lot of people are surprised to hear this, so to give some context, the, the whole population of Newfoundland and Labrador is a bit smaller than the population of Vancouver, the pr proper, like not even the, the lower mainland region. So it's like 535,000 people. Um, so the booming metropolis of St. John's is only about 120,000 people. Um, and then Clarenville would have been even smaller with like, um, oh, well, it was one of those hub towns, I guess you could call it, um, where that fed a lot of community, so about 30,000 people probably used Clarenville, but the, the town itself is only about 2,500. So I come from small places. Um, but yeah, I did write a fair bit growing up, mostly fiction. I was never really good at finishing it, though. Um, <laughs> so I didn't... <laughs> I was really bad at finishing stories. Great at starting them. Um, but uh, yeah, I've, I've been interested in news for quite a while probably I thought I'd be a filmmaker for a while a documentary filmmaker but um probably my interest in news in general started around middle school and junior high is what we called it um and but my family was always my, so my parents were divorced but my dad's house CBC radio was always on um and at my mom's house uh it was tv news so evening news um which was I hated as a kid because it often meant uh, missing the Simpsons, <laughs> but um, it, it did, I think, have a big impact on, on what I wanted to do, or my my interest in, in current affairs, I guess, and my interest in, in news gathering. Um, but yeah, uh, mostly reading and writing at that time with, with fiction. Um, and I, I also, I think I thought I would be an artist for a long time, because I really like to draw, but um, I don't really do that anymore, and, and now it's writing. <laughs> So what kind of books, uh, what did you like? Like, who, do you have any favorite uh, authors back then? Oh, uh, well, for young childhood, Roald Dahl. Um, I was, it was a big Roald Dahl household. Um, and actually, um, oh, the Ramona Quimby series. Was that Beverly Cleary? Right. I think. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, I was big on those and the Babysitter's Club. Um, <laughs> but then as I got older, uh, definitely more into horror. So I really, I was a big Anne Rice head and uh, Stephen King, um, which I, I got a bit of, I think I, my sister was a big influence on that. She, uh, she's a huge Stephen King fan. Um, so yeah, I was, I was often too afraid to watch the movies, um, but that came later in life. But um, yeah, I was really, really fascinated by reading horror growing up. So after high school, what happened? How did you get into the journalism proper from, from high school? Well, so from high school, um, I did. I knew I wanted to go to journalism school eventually, but I wasn't quite at night at eighteen. I wasn't quite ready to to fly the coop yet. So <laughs> I went to Memorial University of Newfoundland, Labrador, um, and I got started almost right away with the student newspaper there called the Muse. Um, and so that was like I, I have a 
a Bachelor of Arts with a major in Russian and a minor in history. But I, I like to tell people that what I really studied was student newspaper. Because <laughs> um, that was that was my passion. I even stayed an extra year in school so I could be the news editor. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, yeah. Um, for, even though, I mean, I, I'm sure this is, this is the case for, for your generation as well, that just the, the move to journalism school being sort of a requirement in, to get hired is, is somewhat new. Yes. Um, and thankfully, actually, some of my colleagues, we just talked about this the other day, a few of my colleagues didn't go to journalism school and did just do student newspaper, um, which as much as I think journalism school can be interesting and good, it's also nice to see that you don't necessarily have to go there um, in order to become a good journalist. But anyway, that's, that's a bit of a sidetrack. Um, <laughs> So I, yeah, I, I applied to a bunch of journalism schools for grad school. Um, and I'd, I'd been in Vancouver the year before. And so I graduated in 2008 from undergrad and I'd been in Vancouver for a Canadian university press conference in 2007 uh-huh. and really fell in love with the place. I mean, for one thing, I went there in January and there was no snow. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, just, I don't know if you've been to Newfoundland before, but the trees, the, the soil is very acidic and thin. So anything that grows there is short and stout and hardy. And so coming here and seeing trees as big as skyscrapers was just well, yeah, fascinating. Was, and I was just going to ask how you got from St. John's to Vancouver from one end to the other. So yeah. That answered the question yeah, right so, there. <laughs> yeah, no, I was just, I mean, the mountain, like we do have big hills in Newfoundland and on the west coast like it's a very hilly province and then on the west coast of the island there's growth morn but I had never really seen mountains just like on the everyday like outside my window like I had in Vancouver and um and so I just I fell in love with it so I I applied to a few schools um and UBC was a whim I was like because I didn't think oh you know that's so far um I, there's no way I ever ended up going there but then I applied and I got in and I the few people that I did know who were going to journalism school from the student newspaper, it seemed like everyone was heading to Ontario. Yes. Um, and that that was kind of like Ontario or Alberta is kind of like the place that every or the two places that everyone from Newfoundland go. Um, and I guess to backtrack a little, um, until I got to university when Newfoundland experienced like an oil boom, it was always sort of a given that you would leave um, to to make your fortune elsewhere, and so. I, I don't know. I had, I guess, a bit of a, a rebellion, sort of, in not wanting to go to Ontario or Alberta. <laughs> <laughs> right. So uh, I got the chance to come to Vancouver, and so I, I took it. Um, and other than a short period after I graduated from journalism school, when I, I moved home for a bit when I didn't have a job, um, other than that, I haven't really left. Um, and that was in, ooh, 2010. 2010. So, yeah, I've been here for 12 years. Wow. Um, and then uh, now, of course, we're talking about uh, Katie Hislop working at the Thai E. So, how did you get mm-hmm. to the Thai E from uh, UBC? I'm assuming it was UBC. Well, <laughs> it was UBC, yeah, the Masters of Journalism program there. And yeah, full disclosure, one of my professors was co founder of the Thai E and editor in chief, David Beers. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, he, he was looking for a part time education reporter. Um, and he, another, I, I had been volunteering with the three paper here in Vancouver, Megaphone. Right. Um, and, and the editor in chief, uh, at the time, Sean Condon knew David Beers and they were talking about how Dave was looking for an education reporter and did Sean know anybody? And Sean mentioned me. Um, and so Dave knew me, uh, I'd taken a class with him, but. I guess I hadn't been on his radar as the education reporter. So um, he just, he offered it to me and I had actually already been offered a job as the news editor for the Athabasca Advocate. I believe it was what it was called, which is in Athabasca, Alberta, small town. All right. I think I would have been one of two, one of, one of two employees, but I, you know, I would have been making, I think it was the, the offering, the starting salary was uh, $30,000 or $29,000. Um, more than, you know, I definitely ever made in my life, but, um, and then the Thai was offering this part-time gig for, I think like $10,000 for 10 months or something. But 
I, you know, I knew people in Vancouver. I didn't know anybody in Athabasca, Alberta. No. Um, and I, you know, I already knew that I love Vancouver and I knew that I love the Thai. So I, I just, I leaped at it and took that job and eventually managed it to finagle it into full-time work. Um, and yeah, I've been there ever since. It's, it'll be 12 years in September. So what is the Thai? E? All I know about a Thai e is that it's a fish. A pretty big fish. Mm. And that's about it. Yeah. And I, I'm playing dumb here. I've got it up on the computer screen. But uh, tell us, uh, like the TIE, an online newspaper. That's all I know. How does, yeah. that, how does that work? So, how does that work in real life? <laughs> so TIE so tai means the biggest um, in a few First Nations languages, I believe. But it's a, it's a Chinook word as well. Um and yeah, it, it often does mean like the biggest salmon. Um, and so it's an online news magazine that's been around since 2003. Um, it, the old slogan, although it still applies, would be paywall free since 2003 um, because we don't have any paywalls up. Um, and yeah, it's it's changed a bit in the last few years and that it's expanded. But mainly we write about British Columbia news, um, art culture i'm the education and youth issues reporter um a lot on the environment and it's it's definitely from a progressive point of view um we don't hide our our values at all um but we definitely try you know we acknowledge our biases and do our best to be as fair and as transparent as possible in our reporting um and yeah i think we, we're putting out about three to four stories a day five days a week um what, so do you have deadlines or does the, I'll call it a paper, the TAI um, just is ongoing constantly. People are putting up stories or editors are are curating them and, and then uh, posting them. How does the production end of it work? So um, I, I don't know exactly what goes on behind the scenes with editorial, but <laughs> I do. So for me, unless it's something that's, it's not often that I do something that is breaking news necessarily or, or um, has to go out right away. Right. So it, it depends. So I, I, for example, I got assigned a story a couple of days ago to do um, just interview some indigenous graphic novelists who were at this graphic novel symposium um, that happened last night. And so I covered it last night and, the hope or the plan right now is that it'll run next Tuesday. But for the most part, a lot of my stories will take weeks, um, if not months, to write um, because they're generally more in-depth than what you get in, say, a daily paper. Mm -hmm. um, that's why. That's also another reason why we call ourselves – this was a debate for a long time, whether the Taiyu was an online newspaper or an online magazine. <laughs> um, and we've come down on magazine because the people – not every piece is very long, but they, they do tend to be longer. Um, there's more analysis. There's more nuance in the discussion and things like that. So more background information than you might get, say, in a, a daily newspaper. Um, so really the, the deadlines and things like that vary. And so it's more fluid uh, than a regular daily newspaper or even radio or TV. You just... Uh... Yes, well, you have the yeah. time to expand the story, so that time goes into making sure you've got everything right and uh, checking various sources and analyzing the responses and putting it together. So like you said, you have a bit more, I would say, leeway in that sense. So that is that working out for you, do you think? Oh, yes, to the point that I feel very spoiled, actually. Um, <laughs> I, I kind of don't know where I'm going to go next. <laughs> um, because there's there's not a whole lot of publications there that will give you that sort of leeway, particularly even just to let you write about things that you're interested in. Um, exactly. Yeah, I mean, I, and I mean no offense to general assignment. I think there's a lot of value in being a reporter that can dive into something sort of without knowing what you're what it is and then and learning through the art through the process of writing an article but there's a lot to be said to, to building up a speciality um so and yeah and, and i guess it's an expertise of, of some kind sure well that makes sense and 
Trouble is, I'm a traditional newspaper guy. I used to deliver the Vancouver Sun when I was a kid, lived out in Crescent Beach. Oh, okay. Uh, and, um, and I got to have my daily newspaper like every day since I've been in grade three, I guess I started reading a paper. So I go back a wow. long time. But uh, traditional newspapers, I guess, is the writing on the wall for them, in your opinion? <sighs> so, you know, I feel like... I read articles about how the, the, the death of Prince is coming um, and then other articles about how, no, it's, it's been greatly exaggerated. So I, I'm not sure. I think there is definitely value in taking your eyes off screen yeah. <laughs> um, and in having a paper copy of something. Um, but I think I do feel like it is changing in the sense that, you know, almost everybody at least in an urban setting, has some access to a screen. Um, like if you go to some of the poor, even talking to some of the poorer people in the city, a lot of them have used smartphones. Um, they might not have the minutes to, to make the calls that they need to, but they can you know, go to a coffee shop or a library and get some Wi-Fi. Um, but I think what might be the bigger death of print is probably the conglomeration under corporations that you know, are more responsible to their shareholders than they are to readers. Um, and so that's where I think I'm no expert in this, but that's where I, I think a lot of the cuts are coming from, like right. papers losing their journalists or uh, amalgamating with other sections. Like I was, I was talking to my aunt in Newfoundland and she was upset that, um, you know, that the telegram there is just that, you know, provincial paper is often running a lot of articles from other places in the Atlantic provinces. And they might not even tell you for the photos. She told me that she was having a hard time figuring out where, which beach this was that she was looking at in a picture. And it turned out it was in PEI. Oh. Um, and so I, you know, nothing wrong about learning about other provinces, but when you're, you're opening up your provincial paper, you're hoping to get news about the province you live in. Exactly. It can be, it can be dire for some places, right. especially the smaller provinces. But no. yeah. Um, I heard something about um, a while back that uh, more and more it seems that weekly or twice weekly papers seem to be uh, on the upswing or holding their own because that's what they deliver is the local stuff as opposed nice. to, you know, the big city. Mm -hmm. Even here, I've been in Saskatchewan for 20 years and the local Saskatoon paper has gone from what I used to consider a decent paper with everything I wanted printed off and delivered to me so I don't have to look it up on a tiny screen to, uh, mm -hmm. you know, back to cutting back. They don't have a, only publish five days a week now and et cetera, et cetera. But that's just me as an old guy. Where do people of your generation um, get their news then? Is it always online stuff? Uh, well, I guess, uh, well, one thing I would want to say quickly about just going back to what you said about it going down to weekly is there is, there is some alarm about what news is not being covered. Um, or I have some alarm about what news is not being covered when we cut things back like that, particularly local news and like school board and municipality level like that. That's, that's important. Um, it can have a big impact on people's lives, but to go back to your question, <laughs> it, it, yeah, it's mostly online. Um, I, so I get a lot of my news from, I just go to Google News as a news aggregator. Um, I do listen to, to CBC radio in the morning um, for World Report or the local news. Um, but a lot of news comes from my colleagues who will post things. And we have a, a Slack channel, which is like a, an online sort of message board uh, or messaging services for offices. Um, and we share news that way or Twitter. Um, I feel like there's a lot of different Twitter communities, but Twitter seems to be like it's this big niche for journalists to get together and talk about journalism or the news and share news articles. So that's mainly where I get my news from. And that brings us, of course, to the fake news phenomenon, which started with uh, mm. with that guy from down south. Um, yeah. <laughs> he who shall not be named. But uh, mm -hmm. what? And how do you break through that? barrier there's I think even people I meet every day here in in 500 
person population, Radisson, who, you know, don't trust CTV or CBC. Or they think they're all lies and they think they made it up. Like, what do these people think that people sit around making up stories all day long? If they could make stories up, they'd be writers and filmmakers. They wouldn't be news reporters. I don't understand. Right. I don't understand. Well, that. I, think, I, I mean, if I had the answer to that, I would be very rich. I right. think. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, it is interesting to me, especially because usually when reporters get something wrong, other reporters will call them out. We're not all loyal to each other. <laughs> There's no, I mean, I think we will stand up for each other when, when facing abuse um, or mistreatment. But yeah, no, media love nothing more than to tell you how the other guy got it wrong. Um, so I, I do find that interesting. And I, I don't know the answer. All I can tell you is, is things about what I have read from different public reactions. Um, but from what I gather, there is people are uncomfortable with not knowing, with not having, I guess, concrete answers. And the media can't always give you concrete answers. Um, like certainty, I think, is what a lot of people look for often, especially in, in challenging times. And that can be frustrating to go to the news for certainty because. Right. And people want often, it. Often, yeah want a simple answer a yes or no or someone to blame so, you know. yes exactly and uh, we can't always give you that um, at least not right away not in the moment um, I know that I found myself personally like I, I know some disaster has just happened um, sort of like the, the mass shooting that happened in Nova Scotia back in 2020 I found myself even though I knew that the best the best information is not going to come out for days. I found myself scouring Twitter or online, just looking for any updates, telling me what happened, what's going on, because it was so confusing to see a mass shooting in, in, in rural Nova Scotia. And, and so alarming because, you know, Nova Scotia is not, not that far from Newfoundland. Not that I thought he would get there, but, but we I, never... it had never, yeah, it had never occurred to me. Uh, because I guess I lived a pretty sheltered life, and that's a pretty sheltered area that right. that kind of thing would happen in that kind of area. So people, well, they want answers right away, and they can't always get them. Um, and then I guess, oh, I had another thought, and it's gone. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> story yeah, of my, sorry. Story of my life, so that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Katie Hislop is here from the Thai E uh, News website uh, based in Vancouver. Uh, how do you handle living in a high priced area such as Vancouver these days? Oh, boy. Uh, so I lucked out big time um, because I live in a housing co-op. Um, and at the moment, it has low rent, but it, it was one of those housing co-ops um, all over. Canada. We, we sort of stopped making them when the government got out of housing in the 90s. Um, and so many of them, including my own, prioritized sort of keeping the rents affordable versus making sure that the roof uh, was up to date. So when I moved into the building, the uh, it was what we had a, there was a sort of controversy in late nineties, early 2000s Vancouver of leaky condos, just the way that they oh, were yes. Yes. built. Yep. Yeah. Building envelopes and, and buildings going moldy. So this was, this building had sort of the same setup. So the building, it was a wooden building. Um, it had been leaking from the inside. So all the balconies were condemned. A third of the roof had been missing and was just replaced with tarps annually for a few oh. years. Oh. Um, so I, that was very affordable rent. Um, <laughs> the first time I was able to live on my own and above ground, it was great. Um, but we, we've since moved into sort of a new building that's the co-op for that's another co-op. We're sort of sharing the same building right now. Um, and our rent's comparable. Like I'm paying maybe half of what the other co-op is paying for the same units because we, our rents got grandfathered in. Uh, so I'm very, very lucky in that way. And that I managed to get into a house co-op uh, that I could afford. Super. And that's pretty much the only way. Yeah. Like yeah. it seems every year I'm hearing about friends either moving or buying places in rural BC that they are then renting out. So I guess becoming the landlord, which is <laughs> well, kind of, kind of dicey, but I understand why they're doing it because mm -hmm. they want to stay where, where it's home for them. And it's, yeah, it's, it, it gets really, even when I can afford the rent, it's, 
it can be really demoralizing to be to feel like the city is trying to push you out all the time. Exactly. And uh, I understand and I don't know how I could survive living out there like I did for years. I went to BCIT, by the way, for radio and broadcasting. Yeah, broadcast communications, it was called. And uh, what's another thought here? Yeah, like uh, there's a house a block away from us that just sold for about 120,000. Like, you know. People should. Yep. Be, I'm telling people I know on the West Coast to cash out and move, because you can yeah. like, own your own house here. Well, not necessarily Saskatchewan, but east of the Rockies and west of Ontario, and uh, mm-hmm. own it outright and still have enough in the bank to comfortably retire without having to worry about work or anything like that. But that's just me. I got lucky, so. Oh, that does sound nice. But, I mean, there's also a thing to be, I mean, another thing that really attracted me to Vancouver is um, it's it's a bit of a mecca for weirdos. Um, <laughs> not, the, not the rich ones. Not, well, I mean, I guess the rich ones come here, too. But, um, you know, for the, the queer people, the people who don't, necessarily feel like they fit into the mainstream um and those people and i I would count myself among them don't necessarily feel as comfortable in rural and more affordable places so it's a it's a bit of a catch-22 um I, i i did over the pandemic i did find myself looking at real estate in in newfoundland um and it was oh it was tempting <laughs> i need to own a car and i need to to get over my hatred of shoveling um <laughs> and you know I, I there there are a lot of things that i have access to here that i would miss so um uh, but yeah yeah and speaking of newfoundland apparently you lived across the street from kevin major who's been a previous guest on our podcast i I did, yeah, from uh, grade two to grade eight. So I guess when I was seven until I was 14, I lived across from the street from Kevin Major. His, uh, his kids went to the same school as me. Um, uh, Duncan is a year younger than me, and I think Luke is a couple of years older. Um, so they were, yeah, they were great kids and um, read a few of his books growing up. Um, he's, he's a pretty quiet man, um, as I recall, but his wife was really lovely. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, but, yeah, it's a small, it's a small, small city. <laughs> no kidding. But the big reason is you liked uh, the fact that we interviewed Cassandra Peterson, a.k.a. Elvira. That's what got you hooked. I loved that. I was <laughs> so excited about that. Yeah, I, I mentioned horror a little earlier. I was always fascinated by horror as a kid. And <laughs> I remember going into, I think it was, it was Jumbo Video. I don't know if you had those across Canada, but it was a, a rental chain. And they were playing the Elvira movie on the screen. And I was, that movie, I think, came out sometime in the 80s. So I would have been quite young. But I still remember, like, that scenes that haunted me into my childhood <laughs> until I, I found it. And none, none of us, I didn't really get the, I actually saw it again as for the first time ever uh, a couple of, last year, I think. <laughs> and now as an adult, I get how campy and fun it was. But as a mm-hmm. kid. Seeing like this disembodied hand crawl across the floor that you know wasn't attached to the Adams family um, was really horrifying. <laughs> so I've always been a little. I have always been fascinated by Elvira, and I th- yeah, I think she's awesome. Uh, so I was really excited to see that you'd interview Sandra Peterson. <laughs> well, that's good to hear. And uh, before we go, uh, Katie Hislop, uh, you noted noted that your pronouns are they and them, and why is that important? Yes. Why is that important to people? Um, I'll say of your generation, but anybody, what just, you know, what us old guys go, what are you, what are you talking about? You know, you've got to be one or the other. Um, so yeah, well, then, then, why guess, is that important? That's, that's the thing, because why, why do we have to be one or the other? Right. Um, I think uh, there are lots of different cultures who recognize different genders, but mainly it's just, I think what it comes down to is respect. Um, and what do you feel comfortable with? Um, Because I think for the most part, at least right now, most people do feel comfortable with he and she. But I I don't, I just feel more comfortable with they. Um, And I think, I I think it's different for, I I, know, I know it's different for everybody. But for me, it's more along the lines of, I just, I don't want to be, I sort of reject the role, or the roles that women are put into. And I don't want to be viewed that way necessarily by people i'd rather it be more of a neutral 
if that makes sense. Yes. Oh, with perfect sense. I mean, yeah. Yeah. We're progressive in this household, so we don't care. But <laughs> excellent. Yeah. We, well, we understand that there are different viewpoints, especially from mm -hmm. the older set. And uh, if you look down south, uh, all the things the right-wing Republicans yeah. are doing with voting rights and abortion rights, and and you know yeah. the guy that Ted Cruz guy asking that Supreme Court nominee. Well, if if I decided to be a porcupine, could I be recognized as a porcupine? Uh, I mean, you know, yeah, yeah. Missing, I mean, he's definitely a prickly point. pear. That's right. <laughs> he's missing the point completely. It's not that at all. Yeah. But anyway. Yeah. No. It's it's well, not about it's not about not being human. Um, at all. <laughs> exactly. It's like being human, not the other way around. And so, mm -hmm. just before we go, one more question. Who's the person you would like to interview, meet the most? Oh, my goodness. Oh, boy. Um, oh, that's tough. I don't know. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I don't. Uh, actually, I think... The person, the person I probably want to interview most right now is the person, is um, the member of the school board that I'm trying to get a hold of. All right. They will not talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I'm sorry that I don't have a vet because I definitely have people that are very fascinating to me. But I wasn't expecting that question, and I can't think of anything off the top of my head right now. <laughs> oh well, the one, the one when I started this about two and a half years ago, I really did want to talk to Cassandra Peterson almost from the word go, and it took us like two years nice. to track her down. So. <laughs> the, nice. nice yeah no that's impressive oh good well again thank you i think we kept you longer than we should have but thanks very much for your time today and uh good luck with the Thai e and good luck with uh, managing to stay in vancouver thank you so much this was a lot of fun thank you for visiting with us today this is Talking Books and Stuff with Dennis Rimmer. Contact him at dennis at talkingbooks.tk. Thank you, and may all the good news be yours. Oh, and don't forget to check out his book, The Great Canadian Notebook, available across Canada and at amazon.ca. Oh, oh.